my name's Joan Wood. Welcome to today's episode of Coffee Break. And today my special guest is Bobby, and our special topic is the... The Edna Ryan Awards. Right. Now, I first heard about the Edna Ryan Awards in the year 2000, when Gail Hewison from the Feminist Bookshop rang me up and said that she'd nominated me for an Edna. What did you think about that? I was very honoured. The criteria for nominating someone for an Edna Ryan Award is that they have made a feminist difference. That's the criteria. I know. Now, see, there are women and men doing wonderful things, but you could nominate someone, um, a, a woman who was working in, I don't know, but she's not doing it in a feminist way. It's hard to explain. Well, yes, the woman doesn't... It's not enough for a woman to be a feminist, to be eligible for an Edna. It's a woman who is actually making a feminist difference, is improving the status of women in some way. OK. Now, I have been a feminist all my life. I think I was born one. When did you find out you were a feminist? Oh, God. Um, probably in... Um, at the time of the Vietnam War. When was that? 60s? Uh, le- yeah, no, leading up to International Women's Day. Okay. Early 70s, let's say. Jermaine Greer. Yes. Early 70s. Yes. Jermaine Greer's got a lot to answer for. <laughs> okay. Well, she's very famous for being feminist, isn't she? Well, her book, The Female Eunuch, was revolutionary. I know. There got were lots of women out of their marriages and houses. It was a revolution. Yeah. It was, and see, the thing is, the contraceptive pill came on the market in 1962. Now, without women having control over their own fertility, we would have been stuck. We weren't going anywhere. No. But it was the pill, the pill made and a then difference. something in the air. It was something in the air. It was Gough Whitlam. It was feminism. It was a whole combination of things which really led to quite a, a revolution. Okay. Now, you have printed out um, a, a, um, a, a quote about feminism. Could you read that, please? Yes, this is actually Dale Spender's words from a book she wrote called Man Made Language. Okay, now she's a very famous. She's a famous feminist. feminist yep. Has she had an Edna? She's not been nominated. We should nominate her. Somebody should. We should. And Lynn. Yes, because certainly um, much of Dale's work is about making a feminist difference. This is a wonderful, not some description of feminism, really. And I'm going to read it. It says, Feminism has fought no wars. It's killed no opponents. It's set up no concentration camps. Starved no enemies. Practiced no cruelties. Its battles have been for education, for the vote, for better work- working conditions, for safety in the streets, for childcare, for social welfare, for rape crisis centres, women's refuges, reforms in the law. If someone says, oh, I'm not a feminist, I say, why? What's your problem? (laughs) It's very good, isn't it? It's really good. There's almost no answer to that. Very good. But why does feminism get such bad press in the mainstream? I don't know that it does. Well, it used to. Well, yes, in the early days it was all about, you know... Hairy legs. And Hairy legged dykes <laughs> burning their bras. But that's because uh, people were resistant to change. Yes, I suppose so. But change has happened. I, I don't think it gets a bad press now. Okay. I mean, if you've got a you've got a woman prime minister, God knows she had trouble. But and uh, governor general, women are feminists. Uh, yeah. Things are happening. But there is still a deep sense of misogyny in our culture in a patriarchy but anyway we're getting off the track now every year the Ed and Ryan organizing committee put out um, a flyer nominating women who work in the community and have made a feminist difference asking for nominations yes yep so that you, you you've done that you've put out the asking for nominations and now 
um, we it's organising the um, the venue and the event. Itself. Okay, so the venue is the venue is at the uh, for the last three years since the women since the Edinburgh Awards Committee took over the hosting and the running of the awards. That's in 2012 we started. Um, though the awards have been going since 1998, but that's another story. The current venue is the Trades Hall in Sussex Street in the city. Okay, and it's a wonderful event. I film them every year. You do. And in the beginning, they were organised by the Women's Electoral Lobby. That's right. And then on... And Anne Barber did a fabulous job. Yes, she was the contact she, person. She was wonderful. Oh, she was wonderful. And if you watch the old footage of the ones where she was responsible for what happened, she's running here. She's always in the background. She's running here and running there. That's right. And um, yeah, very successful, mm. but very wonderful. And Ardis Harris, she organised it one year. That's right. But now it's... Um, Organised by the Edna Ryan Committee. Awards Committee, yep. yep. And the Ryan family are involved at this level? Uh, one of the R Edna's daughters is on the committee. Okay. All right, let's go and have a look at some people who've been nominated and awarded an Edna Ryan. Anyway, let me get the ball rolling. And we have two awards tonight in the section called Media and Communication. And our first award tonight goes to Hosi Aziz, is that correct? Is yes. Hosi came to Australia as a Kurdish refugee at the age of 11, and she lectures in political science at the University of Newcastle, my university, my God. She hosts an exceptionally popular Facebook page called The Middle Eastern Feminist, which promotes and furthers feminist ideals and supports women of all kinds, but specifically Middle Eastern women of colour. To date, her page has received over 10,000 likes. Wow, it's now 15,000, so it's gone up already. That's fantastic. The Middle Eastern Feminist is a courageous project Addressing feminism among a largely conservative culture is fraught with problems, don't we know? Hosin encourages an inclusive feminist approach, engaging in discussion and welcoming respectful men. She speaks publicly about her life experiences. From a conservative Kurdish family, Hosin is uniquely qualified to lead this charge for feminism. <coughs> Delving into the realms of feminism in a global context is a daunting task, but she works tirelessly to bring real, applicable knowledge to each and every one of her followers. Please join me in welcoming the beyond an honour to be here tonight. I feel incredibly privileged to be among so many amazing and inspirational women and I'm just looking at all these wonderful faces and I'm seeing my own future and I'm really, really excited about it. <laughs> um, so a year ago, uh, this time, I would have thought that something like this would have been impossible, but here I am receiving this incredibly prestigious award and this is because of the hard work the amazing support and the wonderful friendship of so many women in my life who have basically, to say that it's changed my life. First of all, to Tash Patsy Stone, you are an incredible woman. You are an incredible feminist. You inspire me so much. To my sister and best friend, Sylvia, I'm learning so much through you as well. To Charlene Leroy Dyer, who is an incredibly in in wonderful indigenous scholar and activist who unfortunately could not be here and to Stuart Robertson who together helped to um, allow me to be here tonight, so thank you so much. Um, also a huge thank you to the girls from the Australian Kurdish Association who are here to cheer me on. I love you so much, thank you, you inspire me. Now, being feminist, we are shameless. We will take any opportunity that we can find to promote the causes that we believe in and that we hold dear to our hearts. So I'm going to do this now and I'm going to be shameless about it. I would like to dedicate this award and tonight uh, to two distinct groups of women, Middle Eastern women. The first group are the Yazidi, Christian and Arab girls who have been kidnapped by ISIS 
and who, as we speak, are suffering horrendously at the hands of these terrorists. I hope with all my heart that we can find them and bring them home into the loving arms of their families. The second group um, is the amazing Kurdish women fighters. You might have heard of them on television. The Women's Protection Unit, also known as the Yatajna. Um, so I dedicate to this, this award to these wonderful women who are, as we speak, kicking ISIS ass, pardon my language, and sending them to hell and depriving them of their 72 virgins. So thank you so much. Our second award uh, in media and communication tonight goes to Zoya Patel. Zoya is unable uh, to be with us tonight and she says, please accept my sincere apologies. I would have really loved to have been there tonight. She lives in Canberra and has been unable to meet, meet her. She had intended to send us a video. After all, this is an award for media and communication, but had to work in an emergency. So, But I would like to read a little bit about her so that you'll know why she so thoroughly deserves this award. At the age of 15, Zoya Patel began as an intern at Lip Magazine founded as an alternative to teen magazines, publishing smart, thought-provoking thought thought articles by hip, smart, young feminists. She was awarded the ACT Young Volunteer of the Award in the ACT in, a, in 2005 and Queenpin Young Citizen of the Year in 2006. She became a columnist at Lip, moved to fiction editor, then editorial assistant, and finally, aged 20, editor-in-chief. She then restructured and redesigned the failing magazine and moved it to an online outlet. The magazine grew from 20 to 2,000 daily readers within two years. This year, Zoya founded Feminatus, Feminazi, uh, a feminist literature and arts website featuring essays, memoirs, <coughs> art, photos and interviews. As well as Lip, she's written for Women's Agenda, Mamma Mia, Onya Magazine and the Canberra Times. Zoya now works in communications at YWCA Canberra advocating for gender, gender equality. Through her media work, Zoya has provided accessible pathways into feminism for young women. So please join us again. And Wood and you're watching Coffee Break and my special guest today is Bobby Burke from the Edna Ryan Organising Committee and Bobby has selected her favourite awardees from 2014. So you've also selected this one? Uh, yes, not so much my favourite awardees, they're all fantastic, just particular um, we can't do the whole 14, but I just thought these would be an example. Um, as you all know, Rosie Batty was named Australian of the Year this year, and the same year funding for women's services, in particular refuges, was lost and reduced. There were three awards uh, in 2014 which acknowledged the very important work done by women in the fight for women's services. We now move to another section of the Edna's and that is the mentoring section and uh, we have <laughs> Lynn Cooper devoted 26 years of her working life to the Lillian Howell project founded on feminist principles focusing on the gendered nature of violence and assisting young women escaping child sexual assault and domestic abuse. Of those years she spent 24 as manager of Lillian's, during which she mentored hundreds of young women, <laughs> then transitioning to independent living, further study and place work. She ensured that hundreds of young women had all round care 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so they could heal in a supportive environment. Lynn was able to inspire these women so that they could achieve their goals without becoming dependent either on her or on the welfare state. Many of Lynn's graduates stay in touch 
regarding her as part of their family. <coughs> Lynn Cooper's mentorship has made a feminist difference in the lives of many women. Please join with me in congratulations. Committed to women's right and access to quality health care, Roxanne has led the organisation since 2006. She was instrumental in organising International Women's Day celebrations in 2014. <coughs> is the chairperson of Detour House, a rehabilitation centre for drug dependent women, and works directly as a counsellor and group leader in the Women Partners of Bisexual Men project. For the last six months, Roxanne has been at the forefront of the SOS Women's Services campaign to save women's specialist homelessness services in the inner Sydney area. Because of her unshakable determination, there is hope that the services may be funded for a further three years. the most vulnerable among us, embodying the spirit of the Edness. Please help me congratulate Roxanne McMurray. Wow, that's incredible. I will be quick, but someone sitting next to me who knows me very well just said, I bet you're not going to just stand up there and say, I love you all. <laughs> no. Um, firstly, I want to thank everyone, or well, the people who put me forward for this. It's really quite an honour and very unexpected and quite embarrassing. Um, it's very easy to lead like heart because the staff, some of whom are here tonight, are just amazing, highly professional. It's not just a job for them, it's, I think, part of their life. I'll probably deny all of this on Monday, but they are extraordinary people. Um, and it is, it is an extraordinary organisation. And I think if it wasn't um, managed well by the board and, and uh, it didn't all work very well, we'd probably be haunted by some very formidable characters. <laughs> so you may as well just do it well. Um, as for SOS, and there's lots of SOSs here, including SOS Kate up there, the board of Detour House, which was the original, probably shouldn't say it, but the, the origin of SOS, um, and Leichhardt, of course. Um, again, extraordinary people, and we just all came together. So it's not really about one person, it is about a complete group. Um, and SOS was born out of desperation and complete fear and astonishment that we we're about to see the inevitable closure of services like Detour House, B Miles, Stepping Out Housing, Young People's Refuge in Leichhardt, the only crisis uh, refuge for teenage girls in metropolitan Sydney. Um, and CRC's Women's Program. And all of these people who need these services are clients of Leichhardt Women's. And that's how it came about. We just thought, we can't, do, we can't um, if these services are going to close, it's not going to be because we've said nothing. We have to say something. So that's when people, and I know people in the room, put posters up, wrote letters, from the time that MP started saying they didn't know anything about the issue because they hadn't received any emails, and then about three weeks later they're saying we've got it, we've got it, <laughs> it's okay because we know they did, they were getting thousands and thousands of emails. Um, and the outcome for the inner city, as quietly in this room amongst friends, is going to be very good. should be hearing about that in the next 
few days, but then we have been saying that for three months. Um, but across the state, it's devastating, absolutely devastating. Over 90 women's services run by women for women have been reduced to 14. There are 23 women's services across the state now, but only 14 are run by women. Um, we've lost priority access to about 700 properties, and this is all because of the government's um, policy, which a central plank is no wrong door. And of course, women's services do believe in a wrong door. Um, we believe in a very specialised, gender-specific door. So under the new regime, there's going to be, and this is just indicated, um, from the work of the feedback that we've had so far, less 24-7, less full-time staffing, less individual case management, so there'll be roving teams of case managers. Um, despite what the government says, women will be forced to go into services with men. Um, it's very, very grim. And next year, women's health services, are, women's health centres are coming up to a similar um, um, funding environment, so we're really wanting your help and your support. Um, competitive tendering is here, and it's going to be affecting every community organisation in one way or another, including women's services. Women's, um, so what you can do, just a quick, <laughs> quick little ad, is get in touch with us. Get in touch with us on Monday, send an email to Life Up Women's or through the SOS um, uh, website and just say that you're up for being involved somehow and we'll work out how. Um, if you've had any contact, and I know there are people in the room who've already done this, write to the Ombudsman if you've got any um, uh, opinion about the process and you've got any um, experience of it. And also, we are desperate for donations. So if you do happen to have any spare cash, um, you can go to the SOS website and um, do whatever you can through that. But basically, the central message is women should not be put out to tender. Yeah. Yeah. Bobby, did you ever meet Edna Ryan? Yes, I knew her very well. I used to go and I first met her in, with the Women's Electoral Lobby in about 1972 when things were really heating up um, with well. We were interviewing all of the candidates in the federal coming federal election at the end of that year. And that's the year that Whitlam won, and really the world changed in Australia. Um, Edna was living at that stage in Park Regis in the city. And I rang up and said, can I come and visit you? And she said, what is it that you really want? I said, well, I'm not coming for work. I'm coming for love. I just want to come and talk. And she said, come on in. So we became friends. And then she moved to uh, a flat in Glebe, uh, which was very close to me. And we, can, we had a good companionship there. She used to cook great dinners. And, and I cooked not so great dinners, but we would <laughs> visit each other. I didn't actually meet her, but I know that she was a very, very well-loved woman. And she was very quirky and had a great sense of humour. She was wonderful, really. And she she liked making potholders. And she did make potholders, yes, with, with political messages on them and give them to her friends. Yes, she did that. She was very much, until the end of her life, she died when she was 83, I think. 93, 90 I think. 90 something, yes. 93, I think. Um, she died in 1998. I've just forgotten how old, about 93. She was act politically active until the end. She was a political activist. She certainly was. And a great unionist. I know. She was amazing. Even at the ripe old age of 90-something, she was still out bushwalking and um, inspiring young people. 